Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hello everyone, I'm Nick Claridge and welcome to another edition of Emergency Medicine Cases Rapid Review. Today we're going to take you through low and slow poisonings, specifically focusing on overdoses of calcium channel blockers and beta blockers leaving digoxin overdoses until next time. With anything, it's good to have the fundamentals down. We'll start with the differential diagnosis of patients who are bradycardic and hypotensive, then give you some pearls on how to differentiate the causes. Finally, dive into the management of calcium channel blockers and beta blocker overdoses. A patch comes in. You've got a 40-year-old male, heart rate in the 30s, and they can't get a blood pressure. So he arrives in your ED, and you hook him up to your monitor, and all you get is beep, Beep. Oh crap. Heart rate's in the 20s. So in between the beeps, you frantically think of what the cause is. Well, let's slow this all down for you and give give you an easy way to remember. Just split the causes into tox and non-tox. What kind of things really slow you down? Well, if you're cold, hypothermia, so you can't produce energy, you think of mixed edema coma. If you have a spinal cord injury, or some of the more common things that we would think of, like an MI with cardiogenic shock or hyperkalemia. The great mimic. Most of these causes you'll get from your history and physical. And then we have the toxicology causes. And this will be the main focus of today. So there are the big three. Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, and digoxin. We can usually remember these. But then there's the not so obvious causes. Like some opioids, alpha-2 antagonists like clonidine. And finally, sodium channel blockers. This includes TCAs, flexoral, antipsychotics, propranol, and cocaine. Yeah, the last one got me too. I always thought of that as being attributed to hypertension and tachycardia, but in high doses, after the patient has ran out of all their catecholamines, then we start to see the low and slow effect of cocaine as it, as it interacts with the sodium channels. So we have a differential floating around somewhere in our mind. Now how do we figure this out and nail down a diagnosis and initiate management? It all starts with the basics, history and physical. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes the bottle's right there. Yesterday there were 10 pills, and today there are none. We, get, we do math, and we get the answer. But sometimes it ain't so easy, and here are a couple pearls to help you out. ECGs are good. You can see signs of hyperkalemia, and if you look back to our previous rapid review videos, you can take you through all the potential findings. In a beta blocker overdose, bradycardia is the most common, but it can be sinus, or it can be any type of heart block or junctional rhythm. One beta blocker in particular has characteristic findings, and we got to think of that, and that is propranol. It blocks sodium channels, so it produces a very wide QRS and a very tall R wave in AVR. Also, it crosses the blood brain barrier, so it can alter level of consciousness, cause seizures, and respiratory depression. It's probably the most dangerous of the beta blocker overdoses. Sodolol also may prolong the QTC as it has potassium channel blocking properties. There are also some important changes with digoxin, but we'll discuss that in part two. Sometimes the difficulty can be distinguished between calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, but here are two ways. Patients with altered level of consciousness are more likely to be suffering from a beta blocker overdose than a calcium channel overdose, and hyperglycemia is more common with calcium channel blockers. Thankfully though, the treatment path for beta blockers and calcium channel blockers are very similar with some tweaks that we'll point out. We can break down the management of calcium channel blockers and both beta blocker overdoses into steps. Step one is the generic management of bradycardic patient. More or less, we follow ACLS. So you get the monitors on the patient, you obtain IV access, you check a blood glucose, get an ECG, and then getting your local poison control center involved early. Then giving the hypotensive patient up to one to two liters of normal saline to start, and then you can consider a trial of atropine 0.5 milligrams IV, but both this and transcutaneous pacing will be likely be ineffective in these cases. And you really want to avoid transvenous pacing as this can lead to more cardiac irritability as, they, as it already is irritable with the medications. Step two is decontamination, and step three is overdose specific treatment, and finally, step four is the kitchen sink. Activated charcoal, isn't just a trendy addition to your favorite smoothie. It can also be helpful in certain circumstances, but you gotta know when to use it. Specifically for beta blocker and calcium channel blocker overdoses, it can be helpful. 
So our experts recommend giving only if the ingestion is less than one hour and if the patient is not at risk of aspiration, i.e. those patients who have an altered level of consciousness or who have the potential to seize. Lastly, you want to give in a 10 to 1 ratio of the amount of drug ingested. That means if the patient took 240 milligrams of diltiazem, the dose would be 2.4 grams of activated charcoal. Generally, they did not recommend gastric lavage and whole bowel irrigation. Step 3 is overdose specific treatment. In the case of both calcium channel blockers and beta blockers, you want to give calcium gluconate, 3 amps IV push through a peripheral line, or if you have a central line, then you want to give calcium chloride 1 amp. Then you monitor for effect, and if there is one, you want to start an infusion. If this doesn't work, then we will have to move to high dose regular insulin. Yes, the kind of doses that would have Frederick Banting freaking out. This means starting with doses of up to one unit per kilogram as an IV push plus two amps of D50W, and then starting an infusion at one unit per kilogram per hour, increasing by 0.25 units per kilogram per hour every 15 minutes. How do you know if you've done enough? You want to monitor the vital signs. And here's a little pearl. If you're good with your POCAs, you can check for cardiac contractility and seeing if it's improving. The biggest pitfall here is actually not giving enough insulin, especially in a beta blocker overdose. You may need up to eight to 10 units per kilogram per hour. And with this high dose insulin, what about the glucose? Interestingly, it actually won't decrease your glucose as you might expect as the calcium channels that release insulin will be blocked as well. So you're unlikely to get hypoglycemia. That being said, you're still giving huge doses of insulin. So monitor the glucose every 15 minutes and replace it when it becomes less than 11. You also wanna watch the potassium as it will get shifted as well. As for glucagon, our experts recommend against the use. While you're waiting for the insulin to kick in and you're staring at a low blood pressure, it might be a good time to get pressors on board. Another pearl here is that when choosing between epinephrine and norepinephrine, use POCUS to determine the cardiac activity. If you have decreased contractility, then use epinephrine, and if normal, then norepinephrine is favored. Lastly, the kitchen sink. These treatments are reserved for patients in peri-arrest or refractory shock after all of the above-mentioned methods have failed. There are two treatments that we have in our back pocket. One is lipid emulsion therapy. You can give this by drawing up 100 mils from a 500 mil bag of lipid emulsion and giving it as an IV bolus, and then running the remaining 400 milliliters over 30 minutes. And lastly, ECMO. This brings us to the end. So the next time you see a long pause on the monitor, you can think of the differential. Remember the steps of a calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker overdose, starting with the basics of fluid and attempting atropine, being aware that pacing and atropine probably won't work, and quickly moving to calcium replacement and then insulin therapy at a very, very high dose. And finally knowing that you have lipid emulsion and ECMO in your back pocket if all else fails. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next time when we look in depth at another low and slow agent, digoxin.